and you have who believed in their position. It's 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 a brand new thing from the 1990s. And so they don't like to go through their own history or answer these type of claims. So people like Donnie standing for truth and praise I am and Stephen Anderson and, and Alan Kirshner and these guys, they don't want to admit that they got it from a book that was from the 1990s. It's a brand new, never seen before, sham, wow, shiny position. It's not a historic position. And so there might be tiny elements that they can go, oh, well, see this church father uh, said this back here. And it's like, well, yeah, and he was a heretic or, you know, yeah, um, I'm sure, look, any doctrine, you can find someone somewhere believing it. But they're like, well, where's the pre-trib rapture back then? And what's amazing is the more that I'm studying the early church writers, I'm seeing the pre-trib rapture through, throughout Eusebius, throughout many of the early church writers. So they're making videos saying, Alan Kirshner, oh, there's no um, references to the pre-trib rapture in the early church. Um, it's just it's just wrong. They're just absolutely wrong when they're talking about, um, you know, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, the falling away departure. They're saying, well, you know, it's never been um, defined in Koine Greek as a departure, as a physical departure. And it's like, so I just did a little, tiny little bit of research and found out all oh, the Septuagint says that they were in the departure. Then I went into some of the apocryphal works in within the Koine period and lo and behold, we find it's mentioned for a rapture. <laughs> it's like um, the the Roman soldiers went somewhere, but Mary and the 12 disciples had been raptured. And it uses apost uh, apostasia. <laughs> I'm used to other people saying apostasia, but apostasia. So that, that word is used for a rapture. And it's like the more that you um, get into what these guys are saying, it's, it's completely untrue unfounded and most of the time they're just repeating Kirshner or anderson so these are the two main gurus that i can see now rosenthal's son he's taken over zion's hope um i guess i'll get more into their stuff later on oh what's going on on I am getting, getting a little bit into it uh, with the video series on the seven problems of the pre-trib rapture, but um, I don't want to mix the two, um, not okay. just yet. So we want to focus on the Andersonite stuff. So let's just continue through this. But yeah, um, this whole hatred toward the Jewish people is um, from Tex Mark. I wonder, I, I haven't listened to any, Stephen, I know somebody who is pretty much Sort of, sort of expert on Stephen Anderson. <coughs> I wonder if Stephen Anderson is into um, supersessionism, replacement so-called theology. I'll have to look into that. It's, it's it's not just like an organic thing where it's like okay, I've just thought this through and you know, I just you know studied history. He's like thoroughly saturated in this type of concept most of his christianity and all he's done is just gotten worse where i've looked at this in my christianity and gone hang on this doesn't seem right thought about it like read this all the same material like see anderson doesn't believe in the holocaust he believes that, that that's a hoax <laughs> you know what i mean like imagine like as, as like looking through history like I understand there are you know people out there who say, you know, only two million Jews died and all this other stuff. Only three million died and um, the numbers have been um, you know, bloated and all this sort of stuff. And but you know, Anderson's like all the people who claim that there were you know, mass gassings and all this stuff, they're just liars. They're just they're not Christians, so they're all liars, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's like um I, it, to me, it's just amazing. It, it's like uh, denying the Japanese had prisoners of war or something like that. It's like, uh, do, do you know how many people survived these camps uh, and came out and had stories? Like the next year, we're writing books about this stuff and printing them and talking about their stories and, and the, the amount of people who even today are still alive who grew up in those type of areas, but 
and it, it's getting to the point where most of those most of that generation is completely gone and but but things were so meticulously documented um and i i just can't see how anderson like i've seen people influenced in his direction from you know looking at stormfront uh the full you know kkk skinhead um you know racist type of websites you know where they're just denying oh the jews were never persecuted you know and they just you know will have you know pictures of poor black people there and just sort of laugh at it and they're just full of racist websites um i've seen you know the clan guys talking about this stuff you know skinhead groups um you know racist you know people who believe in the kazar um conspiracies and things like that and it's it's just really strange and I've, I've gone through tons of that material but come out the other end going no <laughs> there, there was a holocaust um you know i've read my camp i've read the protocols of the elders of zion i understand the issues i know what, when people are talking about you know labor zionism um talking about the kabbalah talking about um the the talmud and things like that and and, and there are some pretty nasty things in there and it's like but the and i understand modern um judaism as well but i haven't come to the conclusions that anderson has which is basically tex mars you know, lowest standard uh cringe conspiracy nutty uh type of stuff and that's what i what i discerned when when i saw that, like donnie's channel you know, he's like, oh, you know, pro King, King James. And that's mostly just what I was focused on. But then I started to watch a few of the other videos. And I was like, man, these guys are full replacement theology, which to me is a Roman Catholic concept. And um, these guys are full anti-Jew. And it, it's strange. Anyway, so we'll, we'll look at some of that as we're going through. So I don't, I don't want to... But I just sort of bit lay a bit of a groundwork of, so you know where I'm coming from with this. Um, I think I've got a lot to say about this. Now we've got to listen to exactly what Anderson's saying, and we don't. Want, I don't want to put words into his mouth. I don't want to say that he's saying things that he hasn't said. We want to get it straight out of the horse's mouth, and also we want to look at people who are deeply influenced by him, Tommy McMurtry first, and others, and look at what they say. But let's just continue. So we've got Bob in the house. He's saying, um, hello, both Praise and Donnie uh, standing for truth admitted eventually to supporting Stephen Edison. Uh, Praise even lionized him. Hope you're well, Nick. Yeah, well, um, Donnie has basically exactly the same eschatology as Anderson. And so he even has exactly the same chart, except it just doesn't have Anderson's name on it. I don't, it's, from, it's not his, it's from some other website. But um, to me, he has Anderson videos on his website. Like if you go th uh, through his YouTube, uh, the earliest videos, he's got Anderson clips all through it. And he won't delete them, you know, because he support he thinks Anderson is great. But because people have distanced them themselves from him, he's like, well, I don't really get into him much. But it, it's sort of like, you know, you can get, um, you can bring... Uh, the boy out of Rome, but you can't get Rome out of the boy. You know, it's like he has Anderson teaching to his back teeth. And even the toxicity of like, if you say something that rubs him the wrong way, he, he goes off like Anderson goes off. And it's like, oh, okay. Do, do I really want to deal with Andersonites? You know, and so, um, but he has a, a you know, I'm, his channel, it's, it's enviable how many people look at his channel. He's got some very good stuff on evolution and all the rest of it. But I usually don't watch that. You know, I'm, pr I'm pretty settled with all those things. And, um, you know, I'm sort of like, oh, you guys want to, you know, debate about how old a rock is and all that. It's like, great. I'm glad someone's out there doing it. But I really don't know how they're treating those people. Kent Hovind belittles people. Um, Donnie, just, you know, if... If it's any, um, and, and this is what I found with James White. When I jumped in the ring with him, it was like, ah, oh, this is how you, you you play dirty. Okay, I didn't, re I, you know, I, 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 I realized that I, I sort of expected that, but 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to show everyone how dirty you're playing. So, you know, just standing there and he's using elbows and knees and it's all illegal stuff. And it's like, well, he just need me. He just, oh, is everyone looking at this, you know? And so uh, he had like, James White had no, nothing on me, didn't know me, knew nothing about me, but was still attacking my person. And so uh, it was quite interesting. And I, I did expect that from the guys from uh, Standing for Truth after a while. I, I was like, well, that's going to eventually happen. And sure enough, it, it happened. <laughs> it's like, oh, you can't mention one save, you always save. In the middle of a debate, you can't mention that, apparently. Um, why not? Why can't we debate anything? You know, um, I, I thought it, it, everything goes in a debate. But, um, yeah, so eventually, you know, I'm, I'm answering their questions. I'm answering them with eloquence. And, you know, get, and what I've noticed is what Donnie does, he just ask people like six or seven questions all at once and then starts yelling at you <laughs> and it's that's just abusive toxic anderson type of behavior and so he'll say yeah what about matthew 24 what, what about the reading there and so you're like okay well i'll give you an answer for that but then he'll go on and talk someone else will talk then he'll get back to you and ask you another question it's like oh hang on can i can i go back and talk about the matthew 24 thing why are you avoiding the question? Why you... and, and he starts getting toxic on you and you just like, when you can, you know, spot that type of thing, because a lot of people just fall to pieces and they, they wouldn't stand up to it. But um, he's got some pretty big issues. And so, yeah, but that comes from being an Andersonite, unfortunately. And Praise I Am, he's just like, yeah, I love Anderson. Anderson is the best, you know. So these these are guys who believe that um, you know, Jesus fried like a chicken in hell for your sins. Uh, these are guys who believe you just say a sinner's prayer and you can go out and molest a child. And if the police shoot you while you're molesting that child, you'll go straight from that arms of the child to the arms of Jesus because you're saved because you said a prayer once. <laughs> That's how stupid. It's the dumbest theology. <laughs> ever i mean even the, the ifb stuff the once saved normal once saved always save stuff I, I don't gel with okay but this is hyper once saved. this is like you know you because see at least the once saved always save um guys from the old ifb would say well if they're doing that they're probably never been saved really and so to me that's just a cop-out way of getting around it but it's like okay well it's better than no they're safe they're born again. They're straight with Jesus. It's like, I, okay, you know, the Bible is very clear. Galatians chapter five, you know, that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, one Corinthians, um, I think it's chapter six, where it says, "And such were some of us, but you've been washed." And you know, and it says that those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, but apparently if you just say no they will inherit the kingdom of god you know that's just change the bible so this is the thing i'm against adding or subtracting from the bible whether that is in a, a literal sense sense of crossing out a word and putting a different word in there or in a uh, practical sense of your actions you know so a lot of people they they omit certain doctrines from their life because of a denomination they're in, they're like, "Well, I'm 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 a Baptist, so I never I never think about this other doctrine." Well, what about what the Bible says? Um, but oftentimes, they don't want to upset their friends, they don't want to upset their relatives, they don't want to upset their pastor. They don't want that fight, and they're living a comfort comfortable life, and so they just keep going through the motions. And so, there are complete entire chapters, entire themes that people just ignore, and it's unfortunate, but that happens uh, oftentimes in, in many different churches. I find denominationalism uh, can be a hindrance. It can be good where you jump into a group that is good in many areas. You can adopt all those good things and you can have a very good start, a very good uh, direction. But then um, you're like, well, what about this other, ch this whole chapter is on this issue. And you go to launch into it and there's a brick wall there. And next thing you know, you're excommunicated, you're kicked out of a church. Yeah. Hey, well, <laughs> it's like, well, uh, what we're going to discuss this. Anyway, 
Yeah. This is an Anderson video. Let's get into it. And one thing I've noticed is every group has their own advertising. You know, if you look at the front of a Watchtower magazine, you'll see, you know, the the lion and the lamb lying there together and, you know, a, a child patting, holding a lamb. And you know, th these are things that appeal to the you know. I don't know. So there are certain things in this video that appeal to... Um, the IFB guys, you know, having lots of kids. Lots of kids is like, you know, you're fruitful. You know, Paul had no kids. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not against having kids and all the rest of it, but it's like, um, it's 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 the, the way that things are presented. So say if it was a Roman Catholic audience, you would have certain things that Catholics would desire and would like and all the rest of it. And, you know, if it was a Billy Graham type of audience, you'd have that. But here you, you tend to see, you know, oh, well, he ticks that box. He's got the you know, big family. Oh, he's a soul winner. You know, that's, it almost makes me cringe every time I hear these guys say soul winning. It's like, uh, you know, because it's all it is is going around basically getting people just to put their faith in Jesus and that's it and walk away. It's like they're saved, you know. And how many people got saved? And, you know, they're like, well, you know, we prayed with 10 guys. Oh, they're all saved, you know. Um, where false conversion. I love that. Though. And, you know, um, uh, Beko, uh, the who amount holds, of false she, conversion all that that stuff. out of uh, the Anderson crew is, is, it would be through the roof. And so apparently Wittenberger has gone with Tommy McMurtry a little bit and doing videos with him, but I don't really know all the politics behind it. But if you do know and you want to school me on it, I'm going through all this, so I may as well know it. So this is the chart that um, Donnie has in his book. And this is pretty much the chart that Donnie follows. And so he follows Anderson's teachings right down to the letter. Notice, are the Jews God's chosen people? So it's it's this sort of huge theme in this, but as we're going to see, it's not really a huge theme in the book of Revelation. Um, because I'm going to show you why. When I say it's not a huge theme in the book of Revelation, what I mean is Revelation chapter 2 talks about the synagogue of Satan, but um, that's equated as Jews today. <laughs> it's it's a strange thing. Um, so anyway. Now, Revelation chapter 2, beginning of verse number 1, the Bible reads, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And then he begins to give the message to the church at Ephesus. Now, if you remember at the end of chapter 1, uh, Jesus Christ had told John that he had a message specifically for each of these seven specific churches in Asia. And in chapters 2 and 3, we're going to get into those messages that are tailored to those churches. Now, the whole book of Revelation was sent to each of the seven churches. It says in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and hast not fainted. And so what we're going to see is obviously Anderson would liken himself to that because he thinks he's, you know, got the best church in the world and they're the guys who really witness and they're the guys who really preach and they're the guys, you know, that they've got the, the truth. And so... So in these first few verses, Jesus Christ has a lot of positive things, a lot of good things to say about the church of Ephesus. He talks about the fact they're a very hardworking church. He talks about their work and their labor, their patience. And he says how they cannot bear them which are evil. 
and that they've tried them which say they're apostles and are not and has found them liars so and so um anderson wouldn't even would he wouldn't believe that there are apostles around today so the word apostle in the latin if you look at the um, word missio it's where we get our modern day word missionary and so an apostle was just a missionary they're just someone who goes around preaching and so there's someone who was sent out they go preaching um and so um, anderson has a strange concept about apostles and things like that so here's a church that was good at recognizing false doctrine good at recognizing uh false prophets and false teachers who would creep in claiming to be apostles and so you can sort of get this sense that anderson's like well you know we're like that too you know um but at the end of the day anderson he's he is exposing um you know false prophets and you know, false teachers and and those type of things because he not because he is concerned about people getting involved with those things but because he wants to be right so then you think well he's you know if you're looking at a math teacher and they get every other question right well you think well the ones that i don't understand surely you must be right on those too and and this is one of the things where anderson um you know 90 percent of his stuff is is wholesome food it's like rat poison you know i think it's like 98 percent of rat poison is wholesome food it's two percent that kills you and this is the thing with anderson he's heresy um his doctrines of demons they they're only small and in these other places many times we're like yeah we agree if it wasn't anderson's head there if it was just say your best friend was there and you could copy and paste his head there and he's saying hey we need to stay away from this doctrine and that teaching you're like yeah great great but see oftentimes it's people who have this discernment type of ministry who can lead you further astray than anyone else because you you really put your trust in them and think oh well these guys they must have the holy spirit they must be hearing from god because they're able to you know, discern what's good and they're like solomon they can you know the baby's there and they're saying you yeah, cut the baby in half and it's like what a great decision you know they're they're making clear-cut discerning decisions that um that are true but i mean in all honesty if you were to just grab um the average sort of ifb book like or there's one here in australia called answers it's by keith piper so it's an ifb book now there's quite a lot in there that i wouldn't agree with okay when i say quite a lot you know you're probably looking at you know 10 percent of it i remember I, I actually gave a copy to a missionary when i was in fiji because i had it there and so what i did i, I actually ripped out it was it's like 800 pages i ripped out about 100 pages i was just like nah that's whacked and he had a whole thing on rock musics from satan and all this stuff and it's like you know because of the beat <laughs> i was like man um that, that's pretty kooky stuff but that's the you know chick track um ifb um type of thing where you know you, it, it's quite amazing half of these guys actually have pretty much the same beat but it just depends on where you count <laughs> and but you know if you count it on a certain other beat it's, it's the devil's music all of a sudden and or if you get a tiny little piece of plastic and a battery and you put a chord in one and a chord in the other and it sounds distorted it's satan <laughs> it, it sounds like satan it must be satan you know so um yeah so anyway but let's uh so straight gate says i'm going to be hosting a debate on my youtube channel pre-trib dispensationalist versus pre-millennial full preterist about a month from now i think you'll enjoy it yeah cheers thanks for that that sounds really good they they couldn't bear with them they were evil they they took a stand against that which was wrong and the bible says that they had not fainted they were a church that endured and continued in the faith but look it says in verse four something negative nevertheless i have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else i will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the nicolaitans which i also hate so in the messages to these churches 
Often Jesus Christ has some good things to say about a church and also some bad things to say. Here they're being commended for their, their hard work. They're being commended for uh, exposing false prophets and false teachers. But he says, you've lost your first love. Now, how are they going to get the first love back? He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. So notice, it's possible for a church to get caught up in doing a lot of works, but it's not the first works. It's not the works that God wants them to be doing. You say, well, what does he mean by that? What is the first love or, or what are the first works? Well, if you think about what the first works were, when Jesus Christ instituted the church and when he set up the church, what was the first thing he sent him out to do? You know, he sent him out to preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus Christ. And so Anderson's church, what is their model? Do they um, follow Jesus and do what Jesus did? No, um, because Jesus, uh, he raised the dead. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He did all that. Where Anderson is like, no, those things have faded away. Then it's like, okay, well, what about um, the apostles? Does he follow what the apostles did? No, because they raised the dead, they cast out demons, they healed the sick, and they did all those sort of things. So he is actually following something that's not biblical that would only fall into the category of, like, the early church um, fathers, if you want to call them that. And so uh, he would have to find a group that was cessationist, that didn't believe that any of those type of things could uh, you know, happen anymore. And he follows them. And so he's like, I'll do the first works. It's like, well, and he's just like, well, preaching the gospel. But that's not what, just what Christ did. That A third of Jesus' ministry was casting out demons. A third was healing the sick. And a third was um, uh, preaching. So he's talking about one third of Christ's ministry, one third of the apostles' ministry, and saying, well, that's the, the first works we need to do. And so unfortunately we're seeing that this is the type of thing that Anderson, Andersonites, you know, they reject that type of thing. Um, and, you know, unfortunately most of the new IFB and the old IFB reject that type of thing as well. And so uh, we've seen that sort of come to light in the, the new cessationist uh, video that's come out which has been uh, quite controversial, not really controversial, but just sort of rehashing the, those old, old arguments that, you know, God, um, it's not that God can't do miracles, but he just doesn't want to anymore. <laughs> it's like, okay. So, um, and what I find is uh, there's so much uh, scripture that's distorted in those videos, but let's let Anderson continue himself said that he was come to seek and to save that which was lost and if you remember he sent out his apostles uh, two by two to go everywhere preaching the gospel okay so yes he did send them out two by two but um other times he uh it, that happened like i think twice but um that doesn't mean that that has to be the biblical pattern I remember meeting some guys and they were saying, no, you have to go out two by two. That's what Christ commanded. And you're not allowed to bring any money. You're not allowed to do this. And you're not allowed to do that. And so they were showing me the scriptures. But then when you read the second time, he's like, uh, well, or just before he got crucified, he said, I told you not to bring a bag with money or to do this and to do that. But now I want you to bring a bag with money. I want you to bring a sword. I want you to bring this. I want you to bring that. And it's like, the complete opposite of what he said and so you've got to take all that into context and so anyway that it's probably more so this group that i ran into because they were saying if you work a secular job you're in sin you need to not have any money and i was like how do you live and they're like well just on the generosity of others sort of wink wink you know give us some money <laughs> sort of thing and i was like oh well, we'll see if god provides for you if i don't if i don't give you any and you know soon they didn't want me as their friend anymore and they were you know, trying to you know talk to someone else and they gave them money and then also in acts chapter one when we see jesus christ ascend up to heaven the last thing he told him to do before he sent it up to heaven was to be witnesses unto him both in jerusalem and all judea and to samaria and under the othermost parts of the earth boy at the end of the book of matthew at the end of the book of mark at the end of uh, the book of Luke, John, you know, they're always being given this commission. But not just commission. Because they were given a commission to go and preach 
and it talks about signs and wonders following them. And it talks about, you know, um, casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, uh, healing the sick, um, you know, all these type of things. But that's sort of, it's, oh, well, oh, let's just delete them from the discussion. To go out and preach the gospel to every creature, that was supposed to be the main goal and the main purpose of the church, to go out and reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel to every creature, to win souls. And it's possible for churches to get so busy doing a lot of other works that they forget their first love, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of people that compels us to go out and win the lost and to go out and reach people with the gospel. Now notice, the way to get your first love back is to do the first works. And by doing the first works, you'll get the first love. You see, when you're out knocking doors, preaching the gospel to every creature, when you're out winning souls to Jesus Christ out in the highways and hedges, you know, that's going to put a lot of love in your heart. You know, when you... And that's exactly true, but I, I just don't find that with Anderson. I, I just I just feel that he's heard that preached and he wants to say that. Um, I just felt feel like if you actually ran into Stephen Anderson in the street, he would just be obnoxious. He'd be toxic. He would be a psych psychopath, like he, like he is in his church, preaching to people, oftentimes screaming and jumping on the pulpit and and um, you know, yelling at the top of his lungs. And um... you get out there and you got your Bible and you're giving the gospel to somebody who's not saved. You know what? That's when you'll understand what love for the lost is. Yeah, but. See, Anderson's teaching would teach that, okay, if you ran into someone and they had cancer and they're about to die, then God probably, yeah, you know, I'm not sure of his level of uh, cessationism, but most cessationists would say, well, God probably put that cancer on them to teach them a lesson or whatever. And so, um, you, you know, you, there's not much you can do about that. They're, they're just sort of stuck in that situation. And so you, you can have compassion on them and all the rest of it, but you can't really do anything about it where the disciples, where Jesus, he had compassion on people and he was moved with the crowd and he, he went and healed them. The same with the disciples. They were going around, you know, they would see a need and they would fulfill that. Where Stephen Anderson's like, well, just say this simple prayer, then you can go off and fornicate, you can go off and rob a bank or shoot someone in the face or shoot yourself in the face or go and molest a child or something like that and you stay, you're saved. You know, well, I'm actually, I'm actually not sure about the molesting child thing because he thinks um, homosexuals are child molesters and so they're reprobate. So I'm not sure if, you know, how, you know, if they can ever have been saved. And so this is where, you know, I guess I've got to come up to speed with his bizarre teachings on this. Uh, I'm only just thinking of the normal, you know, once they've always saved type of thing. But um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll just let him continue. But all that to say this, this particular church at Ephesus no longer exists anymore. This church that was good in a lot of areas, but they'd lost their first love, that church no longer exists. You couldn't go attend that church today. You say, well, then that means that this scripture is not applicable. Well, no, because obviously we could apply this today to any church, couldn't we? You see, there could be a church today that's a lot like the church at Ephesus that has lost their first love. Now, as we see these messages to the seven churches, they had good things, and in many cases they had bad things said about them, but we can apply those to us and say, well, wait a minute, if he didn't want the church at Ephesus to lose their first love, he doesn't want us to lose our first love. Later on, he's going to talk about the church of Thyatira that had fornication present in that church. Well, obviously, we can look at that and see Jesus Christ's reaction and anger toward fornication and, and realize that God is just as angry today about fornication in a church. Or later on when he talks about a church that's being persecuted and going through great tribulation and trials, we can apply that to our church when we're going through tribulations and trials. You see, any church could go through phases in its life where it's like the church at Ephesus or where it's like the church at Smyrna or where it's like the church at Pergamos. These are basically pattern churches where we can look at the things that were said unto them and apply them to our own churches today. Now. Okay. So I would agree with that. You know, I, I think that where it talks about the church of Ephesus, this, the, 
the church of laodicea that, that it's just like if we we're reading one corinthians or ephesians or galatians we, we can apply um lessons that were for that church to our lives now obviously there were certain things directly happening to them so um we've got to take that into consideration but the uh, principles that were laid down can be applicable to our lives and our churches and so i would agree with that to me that's just normal teaching but um you're going to be quite amazed at what anderson says about the jews here um so he's going to move on i think it's um sort of around near halfway he starts talking about the jews but he does a complete black backflip on this whole concept and so we're going to so see, that. see that a lot of people teach that these seven literal churches were actually ages or periods of time like now i've never followed that i heard a guy preach that once and i was like no it doesn't make sense i actually studied through and went okay well from this date to this date why is that special looking up those dates in church history and going why would you say that that's only to do with that church or why are you thinking that persecution only happened in that era or you know persecution when you look at the fox's book of martyrs it was happening all the way through and so there's more persecution happening today than ever before. And so, um, you know, to say, oh, well, a certain church period, you know, back in back in the day, oh, that was a persecuted church. Well, uh, no, we're, we're looking at, you can be living in the United States where there's you know, freedom and, you know, you, you're not going to have guys with machine guns turn up to your church and, and shut it down unless you, you know, haven't obeyed the COVID rules. But, you know, most for most of the time, it's like you... Uh, you have general freedom where a lot of the world doesn't have that. And so um, you can have persecution in one country and right next door have complete freedom. And so like look at uh, South Korea and look at China. They're, they're very close. Um, but you can, or you know, North Korea, you know, just over the border, you can have uh, people imprisoned for their faith. I, I've heard it said this way. Well, you know, right after the time of Christ was the Ephesus church age. You know, then we get into the Smyrna church age. Then we get into the Pergamos church age. And then, of course, everybody always says we're living in the Laodicean church age. So this is a Clarence Larkin chart. And so these whole things uh, or, or these this whole concept of having these church ages, um, it's it's just rubbish and it, it doesn't fit and um i think what's happened is people aren't discerning um in chapter one it says write the things which you have seen and that was uh, chapter one because um john had seen christ the things which are which is the seven churches but that the things which are are the things which are in john's day not the things which are now in the in the dispensation of the age of grace sort of thing and then it's like and the things which shall be hereafter so it's the meta tufta which appears twice there in um, revelation chapter one it says and after this so it's just meta tufta uh, i saw a door open in heaven and a voice like uh, a trumpet saying come up hither and i will show thee things which shall be hereafter and that's meta tufta again so to me that's pointing to from that moment on in revelation chapter four verse one is a future a period of time and so uh to me that makes perfect sense but this whole year seven um churches are to do with seven different ages if you haven't heard of that well if you just look into it you'll just see how ridiculous it is but uh, and i'm in agreement with anderson it's wrong which is the last of the seven churches well, i should say anderson's in agreement with me because <laughs> that's addressed and if you remember the problem with the church at laodicea was that they were lukewarm. They were neither cold nor hot. And they say, well, you know, if you look around today at believers, you know, they're very lukewarm. They're neither cold nor hot because we're living in the Laodicean church. Now, I don't believe in that for one second. And there are a few reasons why. First of all, I do not believe in the doctrine of what's called the universal church. You know, this teaching that basically says that all believers in the whole world make up what's known as the church. <laughs> so I'm, I guess... It depends on um, how you've been, you know, raised.